much. Good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Francesco Muredu. I'm director uh, at the Lisbon Council, a think tank uh, based in Brussels. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the high level summit, Open Research Infrastructures, how citizens can play an active role in the advance of groundbreaking research. Uh, this uh, summit uh, is taking place within the scope of the project Reinforce Research Infrastructures for Citizens in Europe, which is a research and innovation uh, project supported by the European Commission, in particular by the SWOF, so Science Within for Society Work Program. So the, the summit starts from the, the fact that Europe is home uh, of major world-class research infrastructures, and those uh, uh, research infrastructures are a, a crucial enabler of research and technological innovation. And uh, those research infrastructures can also play an important role in eliminating uh, uh, anti-intellectual beliefs in society, and also in providing citizens uh, with uh, uh, some intellectual ammunition that are needed to become uh, critical consumers of scientific uh, knowledge. But in order to do that, we need to create a well-functioning ecosystem, uh, an ecosystem in which uh, professional researchers and citizen scientists can co-create together. And this can be done only if uh, citizen scientists can uh, be empowered, uh, not only with access to research output, uh, research, so output of research performed by scientists, but also if we allow and we uh, stimulate uh, citizens in taking part to the process of scientific discovery uh, themselves. In this regard, it's very important to rethink policies that can make infrastructures a key player in citizen science and that can constantly involve citizens in order to help citizens themselves to become citizen scientists and to, have, uh, to give a value contribution to managing the data avalanche that comes from research infrastructures. It is a, a pleasure for me to be joined by such a distinguished uh, set of speakers. Uh, we are going to start with uh, Claudia Fabocartas, who is a, a project officer and EXA, uh, European Citizen Science Association. And she's project officer of the uh, EU Citizen Science Project in which uh, she leads the work package on platform, community and network building. And basically, she will open the discussion with an overview of policy objectives with regards to citizen science across Europe. Um, Claudia, she's very expert in the, in the field, and most recently, she, she provided uh, a very inspiring speech involving citizen science uh, uh, in order to contribute to evidence-based policy making uh, at the uh, cluster project, uh, pro uh, sorry, cluster workshop, evidence-based policy making in Europe Summit 2021. After Claudia, we are going to have uh, uh, Emmanuel Cesmelis from CERN, who is an experimental particle physicist and is a senior physicist at CERN and is also visiting professor at the Department of Physics of the University of Oxford. And uh, Emmanuel will provide an overview of the most important research infrastructures in Europe for particle physics. Afterwards, we are going to have uh, Marina Manzoni, who is policy officer at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. And Marina will present the European Union's perspective. Uh, Marina is one of the authors of the report Exploring Citizen Science Strategies and Initiatives in Europe, which was published last year. Afterwards, we are going to have uh, the project coordinator, Stavros uh, Katsanevas. Uh, Stavros is the president of the Council of the European Gravitational Observatory, EGO, and is project co coordinator of uh, Reinforce. And he's a very uh, accomplished physicist. In fact, in 2000, he received the physics prize from the Academic of Athens for his work on supersymmetry. And in 2011, he was awarded the Ordre National du Mérite, which is an order of state awarded by the president, the president of the French Republic. Uh, so Stavros will basically present uh, the uh, reinforced approach to citizen science. Uh, and uh, basically, we are, he's going to present uh, the, the demonstrators of the project and how citizen science is really carried out with the scope of reinforce. Uh, after uh, uh, such a, a set of distinguished speakers, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, briefly the policy roadmap on research infrastructures for citizen science in Europe. And then I'm going to uh, moderate a panel with the speakers 
And the last part of uh, our workshop uh, will be devoted to uh, a co-creation section on the roadmap itself. So now uh, it's my pleasure to uh, leave the floor to Claudia Fabocartas. Thank you very much. Um, many thanks for having me to the Reinforce project for organizing this event and to the audience for listening. Thank you also Francesco for the um, introduction. Um, so as you said today, I will be talking about citizen science, some of its benefits as well as some of um, the bottlenecks or challenges for its uptake. And so I would like to start my presentation with a reminder that there is no one universal definition of citizen science since it comes with dynamic standards, methodologies, theories and techniques. However, I would like to dedicate just this one slide to what citizen science is as a short introduction to the topic of today's webinar, so we are all on the same page. The citizen science projects or activities actively involves the public in scientific endeavor that generates new knowledge or understanding. It has also the potential to bring together science, policymakers, um, and society as a whole in an impactful way. Citizens may act as contributors, collaborators, or as project leaders and have a meaningful role in the project. And so they can participate in many stages of the scientific process. For example, from the design of the research question to data collection and volunteer mapping, data interpretation and analysis and publication and dissemination of results and everything in between. So let's quickly see two examples of citizen science in research infrastructures. Um, yeah, of course, besides the reinforced demonstrators. Um, one is um, at OPERAS. OPERAS is the European research infrastructure supporting open scholarly communication in the social sciences and humanities in the European research area. And the COESO project, which stands for Collaboration Engagement, Collaborative Engagement on Societal Issues, is funded by the European Commission and supported by the OPERAS research infrastructure. And the aim of this project um, is to develop and sustain citizen science research in the social sciences and humanities. Um, the other example I wanted to shortly illustrate um, is based on the EOSC, that is the European Open Science Cloud, which is a large virtual infrastructure to support and develop open science and open innovation in Europe and beyond. Cost for Cloud, which stands for Co-Design Citizen Observatory Services for the EOSC Cloud, aims to boost citizen science technologies, addressing one of the biggest challenges of citizen science, which is the quantity and the quality of data, as well also as maintaining the citizen observatories that are used to collect this data. The 12 technological services developed by Cost for Cloud, which are co-designed with several stakeholders, will be made available and are partly already available in the open science, European Open Science Cloud. I'm sure that there are um, other projects situated in research infrastructures, but since I, I work in Cost for Cloud and Excel third party of COESO, I, um, I'm so sure to talk about um, both of these ones. So this is not a complete list, but some of the benefits or added value of citizen science for scientists and researchers um, are listed here. One is that scientists can get data from places they wouldn't otherwise reach. They can get efforts from citizen science scientists in collecting data and analyzing it. And both of these points may contribute to an enlarged quantity and often also quality of data um, collected or analyzed. Also, they get access to resources such as um, a weather station in a private backyard, for example. There are some um, benefits also on the side of citizens, and here I'm not aiming to be exhaustive, but just to name a few, which are, for example, to learn about a topic through informal learning by participating in the citizen science activity or project. Citizens can get also a better understanding about scientific processes and they can contribute to science. They can also get the ability to provide evidence, for example, about other pollution or noise in an area, which can inform policy making. This is especially interesting in cases of um, community science, um, which is more grassroots or bottom-up. And depending on the activity, citizens can develop valuable skills. 
on a more overarching level, citizen science promotes the democratization of science and produced knowledge. It fosters also mutual learning and increases the trust of society in science. So opening up research infrastructures to um, embed citizen science is great, of course. So now without wanting to be exhaustive, I would like to highlight some bottlenecks or challenges for introducing, for mainstreaming, or for the uptake of citizen science in research infrastructures that should be considered in my opinion. However, most of these challenges do not only apply to research infrastructures, but to the uptake of citizen science more generally. One of the main ob obstacles hindering the uptake of citizen science is the lack of awareness or maybe the insufficient awareness or understanding of its benefits the potential or added value. And I think it's important to build a strong evidence base of impactful citizen science activities or projects that demonstrate the benefits of citizen science. And this not only in terms of the benefits gained from involving citizens in the scientific process, but also beyond the benefits to scientific research. For example, also in um, informing policymaking processes. Another bottleneck or challenge relates to capacity building and to training to conduct good citizen science. And one might ask whether there are enough researchers able to adopt and implement citizen science and whether current infrastructure could support this. On one hand, awareness raising about citizen science is needed for a variety of research disciplines and in new territories. On the other hand, training on citizen science, citizen science approaches and citizen science methodologies and data infrastructure is necessary so that more research and innovation actors adopt citizen science and embed it in the research activities. However, this probably needs to go hand in hand with working with national funders to identify the policy aspects that need to be addressed to support citizen science. The next point um, is on data quality and data quality concerns, which are an important limitation um, to the recognition of the results and outcomes of citizen science projects and activities, even if this concern is sometimes based on prejudice. Um, key factors in addressing this are thorough protocols, a correct design tailored to the activity that's being carried out, and an appropriate evaluation. And this is also an argument for training aimed at scientists who are not trained or familiar with how to design high quality processes for a wide audience which um, might differ from the approach to quality assurance and data collection used in standard or more close city scientific research. Addressing data quality concerns increases the likelihood that citizen science produced data can be taken up in formal data streams as well. When academic, let's say data and citizen science produced data are merged or integrated, new challenges appear. For example, how to ensure consist consistency and um, here adhering to metadata standards can overcome that or partly overcome that. This and following um, fair, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable principles allows for the interoperability of data. And I quickly mentioned um, the Cost for Cloud project before um, interoperability there is an essential part to integrate the services that they are producing for citizen observatories developed in the EOSC ecosystem, for example. Another challenge um, or bottleneck is um, one that concerns the attribution of scientific research and results. These are often a lack of transparency um, and acknowledgement of the work done by citizen scientists and volunteers. That the nature of the effort is voluntary does not diminish the fact that their contributions need to be valued and recognized. And added, acknowledgements to scientific papers or even listing, li yeah, listing um, citizen scientists as co-authors, depending of course um, on their contribution, are ways to address this. However, GDPR implications need to be cleared, as well as questions of data ownership, for example. And now coming to my last point, opening research infrastructures to adopt citizen science not only means to allow working with people from inside and outside research institutions and generally being more open, 
but also means to engage with citizens. And um, citizen scientists' engagement, and management, and care is not self-explanatory, and it requires time and resources. So it makes sense to have or establish a point of contact for citizens and for citizen science in rather large research organizations. So citizen science and more formal academic scientific research are brought together and engage in dialogue. And with this, I'll thank you all for listening and I'll put my contact details in the chat in case you have any further questions. Thank you, thank you very much, Claudia. Um, well, there are a lot of uh, insights that uh, uh, we kick off discussion for sure uh, in our panel. So uh, I give the floor now to Emmanuel Cesmelis. Please, Emmanuel. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I hope you can see my slides. Um, it's a great uh, honor to be here uh, to address this the audience. And I will just um, give a, a short introduction of uh, the research infrastructure that we have at CERN. Um, and then we'll, in the panel discussion, we can go further into details of what sort of uh, uh, engagement we have uh, the, with citizen scientists, as it were. So um, CERN is uh, indeed the, the biggest laboratory for particle physics uh, has become in, in the world. And uh, its main goal is to understand the fundamental particles and the laws of the universe. So indeed here you can, you can see the, the main flagship program, which I'll be focusing on the LHC, which is this 27 kilometer ring in the Geneva region. There's the city of Geneva. And, um, and this infrastructure is unique in the world in that it does uh, sit within um, uh, the Geneva area situated about 100 meters underground is where the tunnel is and it straddles uh, the, the uh, Swiss and French border, as you can see here, highlighted in orange. So the four pillars uh, that underpin CERN's mission and in which we, we have engagement, uh, not only with practicing scientists, but also uh, with the society at large and citizens at large, is, is of course at the core is the research in particle physics. Um, but this is very much uh, supported by technology and innovation, by international collaboration, and by education and training. Uh, in terms of uh, the fundamental research, which is the, the driving element of the organization, um, we are looking at uh, the study of the elementary building blocks of matter and the forces that control their behavior uh, from the large scale um, everyday structures around us at the level of one meter, but really going to and understanding how the, the forces and the elementary building blocks of matter uh, appear at the most fundamental level, uh, which today happens to be the quarks um, in the hadrons at the level of 10 to the minus 18 meters. So this is the, um, the understanding of elementary particle physics of the last uh, century, I would say, has led us through experiments in nuclear and particle physics to bring down, to break down the structure of matter down to about 10 to the minus 18 meters uh, in, in the quark sector. In addition, um, we uh, use the research infrastructure at the LHC, uh, for example, to understand what actually happened at the very beginning of the universe um, at a fraction of a second after the Big Bang itself. And this is reproducing the conditions of energy and, and matter, which existed a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, and that is 13.8 billion years from our standing point where we are today. So how do we do it? We have uh, quite unique uh, research infrastructure in terms of particle accelerators, particle detectors, and also very importantly, uh, computing to handle the big data which comes out of the LHC. The machine is shown here. It's situated, it's a synchrotron situated in a tunnel 100 meters under the Geneva area. And this is built on high technology um, systems, basically magnetic uh, systems and also radio frequency systems, beam instrumentation, cryogenics, vacuum systems. And this, this machine allows um, the accelerator to, uh, to accelerate and uh, close to the speed of light, protons and protons, uh, primarily in the two vacuum pipes, which you see there. And they are brought into collision uh, as they circulate close to the speed of light in the synchrotron um, at four locations around the ring. And at those four locations, we have uh, assembled 
uh, very uh, complex and large detection systems, ATLAS, CMS, ALICE, and LECB, which record the collisions which come out uh, from those um, uh, from those products inside the accelerator. So this is this is happening at very high speeds and very high rates. There's about a billion collisions a second, which need to be handled by the high luminosity experiments at LIS and CMS. So the third component is the um, worldwide LEC computing grid. And this is where uh, we pull resources together in terms of more than a million processing calls in about 170 data centers in 42 countries around the world to be able to handle the more than 1000 petabytes of data produced at the LHC and uh, which is distributed worldwide to this um, very, um, uh, very broad and, um, and large computing center, which is used to store, distribute and process and analyze the data coming out of the LHC here in Geneva. So there are many questions which we have posed. There are many uh, questions which we've been able to answer in the past hundred years, but uh, there are many which remain, I list some of them here. And these are the guiding uh, directions for the future of particle physics um, at the LHC, but also it's in, in its successor facilities here at CERN. Um, I just underline here the fact that more than 95% of what is out there is, has not been identified. Uh, uh, an, 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 in an observational experimental manner. So we do have plans for the future. It is upgrading the LEC to the high luminosity version. Later this decade, a factor of 10 more collisions um, at, the, at this new facility or upgraded LEC facility. And we're also looking for um, beyond the high luminosity LEC, where we are considering building the next uh, large research infrastructure in Europe. And that is will be uh, based on uh, a future circular collider, um, the feasibility study of, of which has been launched last year. And we hope to be able to go to the uh, next update of the European strategy for particle physics um, towards the end of this decade for a presentation of the feasibility study. And uh, perhaps uh, we hope a decision on that new research infrastructure. So all this is done in terms of a um, international collaboration, bringing together, as you can see here, uh, uh, 23 member states, three associate member, uh, 10 associate member states, and six observers, and uh, many bilateral agreements uh, with more than 50 countries from around the world. So this is really um, uh, science for peace at the international level, bringing in scientists, engineers, students uh, from around the world to carry out the research uh, at CERN. And if you really look at uh, zoom in, to the number of scientists which use our facilities, in, in addition, of course, to the 2,600 uh, members of personnel on the CERN payroll, we have about 11 and a half thousand visiting scientists and engineers coming from uh, making up about 110 different nationalities uh, and, and about, about a quarter of which are, are women. And this really represents a geographical and cultural diversity in the overall program um, at CERN. So we are also a model for open and inclusive collaboration. And I think this is where uh, very relevant to uh, reaching out to, to the public um, and to society in general. The LXC experiments themselves are models of consensus building competition and cooperation uh, under a governance structure, which is uh, fosters this, uh, uh, this collaboration and, uh, and consensus building uh, right from the beginning. We have um, uh, developed uh, the, the model um, Sesame, which is a synchrotron light source in Jordan, is modeled on CERN's governance structure. And also we provide IT infrastructure for satellite analysis technology uh, for use in emergency response, uh, one of the UN agencies in Geneva. So technology and innovation, um, obviously the World Wide Web, everyone knows is, uh, has the, its birthplace was at CERN uh, more than 30 years ago. But there are many more other examples of where that uh, technology and techniques can be applied as developed initially for particle physics. Uh, medicine is very clearly uh, a very key area of uh, the, tra the transport or the transplant of um, technologies and know-how developed for particle physics into the wider society. Uh, but I list the other material science, cultural heritage, environment, security, aerospace, health and safety, industrial processes. 
And I'll just give you some examples of some of the recent work which has been going on at CERN, um, which has found its way into the wider society and in particular into medicine and healthcare, in particularly for cancer therapy, medical imaging, um, and also the production of innovative uh, radioisotopes for nuclear medicine research. So to finish off, education and training, and this is really where we uh, reach out to the younger generation. Um, we have a, a very uh, diverse and broad program of education and training of the next generation of physicists, engineers, and technicians. You can see here some of the numbers. We have more than uh, 3,000 PhD students are registered at CERN at any one time. Um, a, number, a few hundred PhD theses are completed each year. Uh, with the work being carried out at CERN, particularly on the LHC, but of course these students are involved, um, receive their degrees from the home universities. We have uh, uh, programs for undergraduate students, graduate students, fellows, and also organizing schools in physics, computing, and uh, accelerator science uh, around the world, particularly in our member states. So this is really part of our engagement with the, the next generation of uh, physicists, engineers, and technicians, and uh, it's very important because indeed the uh, the peak of the scientific users at CERN, um, those eleven and a half thousand that I mentioned earlier, are in the mid twenties, and uh, those are the typically the three thousand or so graduate students we have here at any one time, and they will move out once they graduate into the wider society. Uh, a fraction of them will continue in academia or research but uh, close to 50% will continue uh, as first employment in industry, particularly in ICT, and about 20% find first employment in other fields, including government organizations. We reach out um, to thousands of teachers and high school students from around the world. Um, we run programs for teachers from 10 scores of countries. Uh, we run programs for, under, for high school students as part of the hands-on physics experiments of the school lab. Uh, we carry out uh, experiments with students on Beam Mindful Schools competition. And then we also have a high school uh, student internship program. So all of this um, is an effort to engage with citizens across the globe. Um, before COVID, we had uh, more than 150,000 visitors and guided tours at CERN from 95 countries. So you can see the footprint that we have uh, across the globe in doing this traveling exhibitions uh, to many of our member and associate member states and open days. So this is really um, a presence in the, in the global context in bringing the science and the excitement of the science and the engineering closer to the citizens of the world and to uh, society in general. And uh, we are in the process of uh, upgrading that engagement with, with, uh, with society, with the, what's called the science, the CERN Science Gateway, which is CERN's new education and outreach center, um, which will be available to the public, uh, which will open next year, and which will uh, aid in bringing closer to, to CERN, uh, the citizens of the world, to experience for themselves what um, basic science is, and uh, the technology and innovation which is required to accomplish that. So in conclusions, we, we have in conclusion, we have come a long way in understanding the fund, some of the fundamental questions in, in particle physics. Um, and I would certainly expect with the LHC, um, its high luminosity upgrade and also uh, future machines which are planned uh, at CERN um, that the laboratory will continue to play a crucial role in the journey of exploration. And uh, as part of that, we, we do expect uh, continuing engagement with the citizens of the world and society to, to, uh, to be involved uh, in this endeavor. So I think that's where I would finish my talk and uh, I hand over back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Very, very impressive. Uh, there is a lot to discover still, but uh, a lot uh, of things have been uncovered so far. Uh, we can move now to Marina. Marina Manzoni, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Francesco. I will uh, share my screen for the presentation that I would like to give. If you please can tell me whether you can see it. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, thanks a lot. 
thanks for giving me the opportunity to intervene in this um, uh, nice workshop. Very interesting people and very interesting uh, topics seen from different uh, angles. Uh, sorry, Marina, we don't see your presentation. You see, we see your screen, okay. Okay, okay. Full mode. Perfect. Fine now? Okay. Yes. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm really, really glad to see uh, the, the, where we got uh, from the last 10 years or, or even more. As uh, from what Claudia said and Emmanuel said, I can, I can see that this, uh, this is a real journey of exploration. And what I'm about to show you is the result of uh, many, many years of collaborations between the international communities, uh, ex associations, the European community, the European Commission, and amongst the different services of the European Commission, uh, whereby um, mainstreaming the, the results that were collected from the dif from different angles, from different perspectives, both between the EC, the international communities, the scientific communities, and internal to the uh, European Commissions from different directorate general starting from DG Environment to DG RTD, DG Connect and the Joint Research Center of the Commission that I'm going to talk about. Indeed, what we can see now coming out from the um, EC pro, from the um, European Commission programs is the results from this work, uh, collective work. And this is really amazing because it's, there are not so many areas where uh, different um, organizations with different purposes can um, interact and come to common results and address common challenges. So now citizen science, it's indeed at the core of the European research areas. And uh, there are many projects and also the, the different framework programs that address citizen science and include it in the um, different research and innovation programs with the key features that have been identified from these uh, uh, heterogeneous communities. Um, and these, uh, and it's nice to see that all these activities and initiatives are carried out from the different from different angles, from the research and innovation angles, from the policy driven objectives angle, and from much wider European Union initiatives. Um, the key features that uh, were I, I was talking to you about that were uh, identified. At and put in place into the European Commission programs are these that you can see. So um, citizen science is promoting open science and includes citizens and societal engagement as a modus operandi. So this has somehow been mainstream in the entire research and innovation program, which was not absolutely not the case only five years ago. The societal engagement, so civil engagement and, and uh, uh, civic engagement are part of the ex excellence criteria um, for which you are assessed during the evaluation, proposal evaluation. So if you are submitting a proposal to the commission and you show that in your proposal, you are also including societal engagement, uh, citizen engagement, business engagement, not just the, those stakeholders classical stakeholders of the uh, area you are studying, but also broader uh, public, then you get a higher score in the excellence criterion for being uh, selected. And the co-design and co-creation approaches that were studied a long time ago and uh, featured now, they are included across the program. So the co-design and co-creation at early stage of the projects are very much appreciated, especially those who include, that, that include citizens, the end users, citizens, civil society and community of, of practices uh, operating in the area addressed. Um, and this is also part, I'm sorry, and this is also part of the impact evaluation, impact assessment as key performance indicator number six. Uh, and this uh, is where exactly uh, the uh, perspective impact is being uh, assessed by 
um, seeing a twitch stage of development, so design, development, and implementation, testing, uh, and use, in which phase of the, of the development chain, at which phase citizens and, uh, are getting into the picture. Uh, this is one, one example of the initiatives that are carried out by DGRTD, Research and Ecological Development. It's uh, within uh, the policy initiatives called the mutual, mutual Learning Exercise on Citizen Science. There are 11 member states and associated countries participating in, uh, in this project. And um, one, the, the, the topics that are uh, featured here in these slides that are the overview of citizen science, impacts, good practices, um, and the sustainable uh, environment and citizen science and scaling up are exactly the topics that were studied together with the international associations like EXA, as I said, and in our research at the JRC. And it's for us a satisfaction to see that people are working around these topics. If you want to know more about the policy initiatives from the GRTD, you can have a look at this uh, um, at these reports, thematic reports, introduction and overview on citizen science, and uh, an interesting challenge paper uh, about ensuring ensuring good, good practices and impact. But there are many more uh, hints to uh, practices uh, and uh, um, and impacts also in other parts of the program. As Claudia pointed to. In DigiConnect, there's a very um, successful initiative in the area of Open Science Cloud, which is called for Clouds. And why is this um, project uh, interesting is that uh, this project is really addressing open science um, as a tool to um, address challenges, uh, research challenges and societal challenges. And, take, and they take into account uh, um, information, not just from the scientific communities, from, but from different um, pro information providers. There could be uh, industry, there could be also academia, there could be also other research institutions, but especially from citizens, citizen science as, um, let's say, professional citizen scientists, or also citizens that are able and are willing to provide information to integrate um, institutional information with the information that they have available that can sometimes can be more uh, relevant uh, and more uh, granular and accurate than other inform institutional information sometimes. And also for the fit for purpose uh, approach that is being um, applied by this project, um, which is, um, let's say the path to the opening up of citizen science to what we call citizens generating data. That is to say, we've seen that this citizen science or data and information generated by citizens, where they are professional scientists or not, can be used for different purposes at different levels, can be used for very specific research as Emmanuel showed, or for other, uh, less specific but equally important and useful services that could be those uh, provided by the council, the city council for traffic or for energy consumption or for um, urban uh, planning, for example. You can see that there are different levels of granularity and accuracy uh, implied in this kind of information provided to the different actors, but this is exactly what we mean. There are, there's there's uh, no, let's say, no approach fits all purposes. We need an approach that fits the, per the specific purpose in that specific um, context. So contextualization is very important. When we come to the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, um, there's a, we have set up uh, some time ago this competence center on particip participatory and deliberative de democracy democracy that provides guidance and tool uh, for developing um, robust policy, um, uh, let's say, uh, scientific evidence. So um, through the application of citizen science practices, um, we 
we have been working over the, the last years uh, on many, many uh, areas and also with many actors, as uh, I was saying, ex, ex, EXA and other colleagues in uh, the Commission and in other international communities. And we have published this activity report uh, um, that lists a number of um, results that have, were achieved during the years. Um, what we're particularly proud of is the Start Working Document Best Practices in Citizen Science for Environmental Monitoring, where we managed to show how citizen science has can have a high impact on an area, in this, area, in this case for environmental monitoring. However, we also show that these best practices and these citizen science participatory uh, approaches can have a high impact also in other areas, like for example, energy and transport, urban, urban planning, and also health. And we have now even, um, we are even using now uh, or applying ex uh, legitimiz legitimization strategies, I'm sorry, to um, let's say support the information provided by citizen science in court cases, for example, for en environmental, uh, purposes. And last but not the least, we cooperate with the uh, other uh, programs the commission, from the Commission and at uh, the scientific communities at large through the COST program. Um, the highlights over the, these last five years, as, as I was hinting to, uh, citizen science, uh, uh, we are um, providing a wider scope to citizen science now, going from this classical citizen scientists to citizen science, citizen generated data for the different purposes that I was hinting to earlier on. Since there are many different stakeholders at different operational levels for, with different purposes, there might be different level of information provided by citizens and, and um, at large that can fit the purpose for which that information has been searched for. Which, what is also in, uh, important uh, is spreading and scaling, so co contextualization. When we come across um, a good practice uh, in, citizen si in applying citizen science approach, we could also see how to spread these practices on a larger geographical level or how to scale it up to a different level, for example, from local level at city level to regional level or internet or national or even international level. Of course, in this uh, process, there are many, many um, influencing factors to be taken into account, including, uh, but on, not only regulations and uh, uh, law and other framework conditions, but this is being done now, so contextualization is seen as a winning card. And uh, portability, so the mainstreaming of pro uh, common approaches has been demonstrated from uh, almost purely environmental domain, uh, citizen science approaches or citizen generated data approaches are now uh, demonstrated to be, able to be portable to other layer area. And as I was saying before, now, uh, thanks to the legitimization uh, concept, that is to say, the citizens are have the right to provide the information to the public authorities, and the public authorities have the obligation to um, acquire this information from the citizens and to use such information in court cases, for example, you know, in environment or in other areas. Um, the key messages that we would like to, to give to uh, in this in this context is that uh, citizen science is uh, has is characterized by a wide uh, uh, and complex ecosystem uh, made by different stakeholders with different purposes uh, with different objectives uh, uh, operating at different uh, uh, governance levels uh, and in different areas and domain. So it's not easy to uh, operationalize citizen science in this kind of uh, environment. And what we uh, found out is that the guiding principle for us to move uh, swiftly in this uh, ecosystem is that first of all, we need to understand 
the objective for which the data is searched, so the use that we're going to do with this data, and the underlying governance model, that is to say, okay, is this used for, um, let's say, a local urban planning um, uh, objective, or is this to, has to be used for, uh, as Emmanuel was saying, for a very specific and leading edge uh, research um, oriented purpose. So first we have to understand the, 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 the use of the data and information we are searching and then the governance models uh, underlying it before we, can, we get to the development of the relevant infrastructure ecosystem through active co-creation processes and approaches. And last but not least, um, for this to be able to continue and to develop, so for citizen science approaches to develop um, in the, at the pace that uh, technology is, 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 uh, is developing, we need to op optimize researching uh, resources by leveraging on the emerging technology, of course, on the computing power, of course, but also on empowered communities. And to this purpose, I hope I still have some time, I would like to show these three minutes from uh, this borderline science that we can show, can give some food for thought and maybe kick off discussion for, um, for the next uh, part of the agenda. Um, let's see if I can share now. Um, the I threw away all my eggs to help improve my vision, here's why. If you are struggling with vision loss and you've also been prescribed glasses, you've got to see this right away. A Nobel Prize winning discovery from Dr. Everyone has an idea of what science is and what scientists look like. Highly educated, highly trained, very serious geniuses. Which is why it might surprise you that some of today's most cutting edge research looks like this. And it's being done by people just like you, through what is known as citizen science. From finding water on Mars to creating self-driving cars, today's scientists are accomplishing incredible feats. It will be one of the fastest scientific achievements in modern history. However, there is one big problem. After research and sampling, oftentimes there is too much data. For example, just to choose one ongoing study, the Cancer Genome Atlas program, which is aiming to map 33 different types of cancer, has amassed 2.5 petabytes of data. Just for context, one petabyte is 1 million gigabytes. Facebook's warehouse stores 10 billion user photos, and that's only 1.8 petabytes of data. So the 2.5 petabytes of data from the Cancer Genome Atlas program is a big problem, and it's not a unique one. The problem is that there aren't enough scientists in the world. Um, there are just, you know, too much data, too, too few scientists. And things are getting worse faster than they're getting better. The number of scientists on Earth won't increase as fast as the number of sequences that we, we're generating. Fortunately, some creative minds found a solution. Scientists sought the help of a rapidly growing community. Gamers. Hail the new kings, Samsung Galaxy! There was a lot of interesting thing that we learned during this project. What are the specialties, you know, when it comes to integrating citizen science with games? Using a strategy called gamification, game developers and researchers are able to integrate complicated projects into exciting and addicting mainstream games, like mapping exoplanets and unfolding proteins, often without gamers even realizing it's there. 
while others have formed communities dedicated to making a small but meaningful contribution to science. One incentive that is really important is actual love for science. <laughs> By utilizing their immense user bases, scientists are accomplishing tasks that would normally take hundreds of years to complete. By turning everyday gamers into scientists, the word can be spread out between hundreds of thousands of people. This all began before Fortnite, before Nintendo, and before, uh, Pong. It all started in the late 1800s. Led by... Thank you, thank you, Marina. A very, very Just interesting discussion. Thank you yes. very much. Very interesting insights and very interesting video. Uh, we are going to provide the link to everybody so that uh, you, you can have a look more, more closely. And now it's uh, my uh, big pleasure to introduce Professor Stavros Katsanevas. So as I said, President of the Council of the European Gravitational Observatory and the Coordinator of Rainfalls. Uh, Stavros, yes, the sir. floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you and sorry for joining a little bit late, but you know, these, these years we spend our time in Zooms all over the place. So my task will be to, to show four concrete examples that how we tried, how we experimented them and what we've learned and what we're still learning. It's not. So <laughs> it's called Rainforce, how citizens can play an active role in groundbreaking research. And these are the partners. Uh, I'll let you look at them afterwards in the, <coughs> in the slides that will be there. Uh, let me see. Yeah. So our goals, uh, let's say in detail, are uh, to link uh, this, uh, to talk about fundamental science, first of all. So gravitational waves, multi-messenger uh, uh, physics from Virgo to kilo, I'm sorry, it's moving from Virgo to kilometer cube and the cosmic rays, and also strengthening the interdisciplinary links with particle physics then show how these studies are embedded in environmental science. People believe that fundamental science, environmental science do different things. We have to understand, as we say very often, to understand the cosmos surrounding us, the, the, our environment before understanding uh, the, the cosmos as a universe. And this is something that, for instance, is very clear in Virgo, in Kilometer Cube and the Cosmic Grain Studies. Then uh, we, when we talk of multi-messenger, we immediately start thinking about multi-sensoriality, not only light and shadow, but also sound and noise of the sound and why not vibration and vibrations and all that we try to embed them in our uh, demonstrators. And then at the end, we hope uh, to, together with the other colleagues producing a similar demonstrators, not demonstrators only, as they are used uh, really intensively, what I intend to show, to make a roadmap and then we set up a date and then hopefully with uh, uh, Francesco, the, the two Francescos we will uh, try to, to make it happen. Then, of course, as I said, uh, we develop social, societal aspects, the cosmos as society, and there is inclusion and diversity. Art and science is a big uh, thing in our thinking. And also how from the treatment of data you extend to critical thinking. So these are, if you wish, the guiding lines that we used up to now to structure our presentations. Come on. And uh, then we have four examples, as I said, four work packages. We have four work packages working on the engagement, impact, and road mapping. It is half and half for trying to understand how the resilience, how we can keep the, the citizens engaged. All that is very important in our program. It's equally important. So we're having two meetings per week, one on, let's say, the hardware and software infrastructure, and the other one on monitoring the engagement uh, of uh, what we're doing. Now, the things that we have to be careful, and we were careful during this creation, was we want to assure close communication. We didn't want to create four silos for different. And then I forgot to say in the previous one, I didn't went too fast. 
as you from many slides, so I wanted to go fast, is that we have a transversal package, which is about sonification, as I said, the multi-sensorial. So we want to assure a close communication between the four infrastructure work packages and the, the sonification work package. We don't want the citizens as classifiers, but we want them to develop their critical thinking. And we, I will show you with examples how we try to develop this. Then being modern, we try to mix sort of uh, uh, machine learning and human skills so that we speed up the process and we discover up things. For, for instance, going down, downstairs, it's in Gravity Spy, another very close to us uh, citizen science program. Uh, the citizens discovered a category that was not thought before by the scientists and was included and in, improved the performances of our sister uh, uh, in gravitational waves uh, interferometer called LIGO. And then, of course, avoid simple illustration and paternalism in multi-sensuality, art and science and critical thinking. Then, with respect to the participants, we want to new audiences. We participate in this big uh, web website called Zooniverse with one million citizen science participating into it, including new categories, senior, disabled, artistic, disposed persons. We have, for instance, I don't I didn't present a slide for that, uh, an, a school of uh, senior, senior citizen sciences, scientists, where we first explain the physics, and then we would implicate them into the classification and other things we're doing uh, and the critical thinking and all, and all the rest. Then, uh, and well, we try to pull effectively everything to monitor, as I said, effectively to not to lose the interest of the people. Uh, it's, it's a well-known problem in the citizen science that you have peaks and then loss loss of interest. So we try to keep it up. I will show to you the instruments we do about that language barriers through translation, and we respect uh, the scientific community. We try, as I said, to show that it is not only outreach and communication and engagement, but it is helps, really helps science. I gave you an example, and there are other examples too, of how this will help. And then, of course, as I said, the roadmap. Uh, so we try to generalize this with all the basic science infrastructures. So I said, we are in the Zoo Universe platform, well known in citizen science. And let me go very fast through the four examples. The one is about gravitational waves. It's called gravitational wave witch hunters. So we present uh, signals that are not, you know, a gravitational wave signal, very often you know it's for, if you have two black holes colliding and things like that, you know what it looks like, but you have other signals in your detector that you don't know, is it noise or is it some strange signal, a supernova, let's say. So we give these uh, signals to the citizens and we ask them to classify. You see here, we have only, I don't know, a few months. I don't remember, it's 70 months. Uh, no, what am I saying? Not 70 months, too much. Uh, it's 70 days, so yes, yeah, two months and a half. We'll have 2,000 volunteers, 300,000 classifications, uh, and different subjects and completed subjects. So, so this is how, for instance, you are presented with a signal and a series of possibilities. And then if you have a new possibility, you put it in. Furthermore, what's more, more interesting is you have in parallel signals from all the sensors of the detector, we have over 500, not all of them are here, and, and you try to correlate. Ah, is this same image here and elsewhere? In this, we do it both in, uh, in visual and in sound. And sometimes people with sound identify better a whip, a whirp, or whatever, that that is common between some detector that created by induction these events. Another thing we do, it is in the deep of the sea, it is a kilometer cube, neutrinos at the, at the depth of the sea. Again, here, uh, classifications, counting, where I hear your background is life itself. Your background is uh, whales, dolphins uh, that can give you or even bioluminescence, they can give you luminous and acoustic signals. And again, you try to characterize the different, uh, different 
images and sounds and signals try to get uh, to get them I mean it's a very interesting thing to to, to do to start scattering uh, try, try scanning thing you identify these peaks and then uh, well, then you put them in the programs to make them work then CERN in CERN, we're looking for uh, decays that are where the particle is invisible for some time. It is a particle that's not charged, and that decays. So it's called displaced vertices. And again, it's different level of searches. Many classifications was actually the first to get there on board, to get uh, to become public. And again, a lot of uh, volunteers of classifications. Although it is a difficult thing, it's not just form. It is really you know, playing a little bit with the images of, uh, of tracks inside the detector, it's complicated, but still quite followed. And last but not least, uh, it's the cosmic muon images, the cosmic rays that uh, uh, we are getting in on. And there, the task again, you know, how we follow up the thing, there it is an even more difficult task. You have hits and you get hints how to identify tracks and see whether the, the, the systems of identifying the tracks are correct or not correct or things like that and how they and you help reconstruct at the end the tracks and so you have here how you do it for instance this is a, if i'm not wrong it's not uh, it is essentially the sound and it is essentially from the OJ. and there is uh, our in the two we have our uh, uh, Argentinian colleagues that create a special, <clears throat> a special uh, software to sonify the data, as we said, so that for two reasons, what we say, not only give access to the, to the uh, let's say, the non vedenti as we say in Italy, the blind people, but also <clears throat> to increase our capabilities as humanity in general to understand things in different more senses than one. It was a very nice workshop organized by our colleagues, EIU workshop called Astronomy Beyond the Common Senses, where you had things like that. Here, I might also try to show, uh, I don't know if I can, uh, I have to stop and redo it, uh, uh, show an image of that. Yes, I think I can do it. Yes, you can start it, but again, it's a big one. I will try to- Hello. Uh, and we can uh, sonify. Here there are a lot of. No. We we are uh, the web interface with a lot of so anyway, data. This data uh, has yes, around thirteen thousands of of rows. We can select a little portion of the data set and sonify it. You can play with different harmonics, you can play with different modes of sonification. It's not just a web interface, etc. Et I don't want to, to enter to, all to, the comments. It's a proof of existence text, only. For example, I didn't play. want to, I didn't want to, uh, to tire you with this stop. just to show it to you. Sorry, I will go back to, okay, I think I stopped it. We so, can apply some I'm mathematical doing. functions. We can change the configuration of the sound and the configuration of the plot. Yeah, that's what she says right now. Uh, and uh, I hope I finished it. Yeah, I think. So, okay, I go back me to, to, the, uh, to the presentation. I share my screen. Yes. So, so sonification transverse to all of them and uh, there are also we have uh, other things that are developing around it for instance we have one that Yasmer said uh, well uh, well known a famous quite famous so uh, celebrity actually in this world of leading sonification of astronomical data working here in ego and preparing a course that it is uh, for uh, the Blind people starting started. It was announced yesterday. Starts in two or three days. The life and death of stars for uh, for uh, for non uh, people that do not see here. For instance, I cannot show you that this is again a glitch inside the gravitational wave detector that you can also see and hear. We develop multi-sensorial telescopes, not only through vision but also 
you can see the moon, let's say the moon, just because it's a big one, but also the stars, both in vision, in sound, and in vibration, etc., etc. So then the big problem is how you keep the participatory engagement up. So we have science cafes, exhibitions, we have, I don't know, I mean, it must be close to 100 uh, activities that were during this past uh, two years and a half, uh, webinars, lab open days. Furthermore, we had uh, virtual visits, a lot of virtual visits from all over the world, from Pakistan to, to of course, Europe. Then uh, we had a vision building workshop where we asked the people how they want to see citizen science develop. We had art and science <clears throat> uh, sort of events at the passage of the year in Rome this year, uh, or the past one, I think it was 2020, I'm sorry, it's the time passes fast. So last year, passing into 21, we had a sonic event together with lasers pointing at the sky at the place where we saw gravitational waves with world famous artist Thomas Saraceno. The, the Greek colleagues do a lot of uh, summer and winter schools that are very important. And they also prepare challenges. And the challenges are interesting because the people that participate to a challenge do the classifications, then get invitations to go to the schools for free and with their, their, their things paid. This is a, an example of what, what we do. I don't want to show it. And this is how we monitor it. And you see the classical thing. When you launch the, for instance, this is the CERN Atlas with the gravitational wave uh, 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 events. It's big peak. And then, of course, it goes to smaller numbers, it goes around 50, for instance. Then you do the winter challenge, and again, you increase winter challenges. You promise the participation in the live event, and that's the most important. And this we have to remember. We should not go to too much digitization. We should also remember that these things, people, especially after the pandemic, want live events. And then, uh, last but not least, uh, we participate and we want to make a big thing, uh, probably together with you, that it was very interesting presentation, the ones I followed. And I know, we know anyway, <clears throat> CERN is uh, will be a big actor in this. This year is the United Nations International Year of Basic Science for Sustainable Development. And this is typically what the things we're doing uh, when we talk about the citizen science and the research infrastructures. So this is it. My last uh, slide, my ideas, my little bit on the run ideas and things that we could do further down. One that we have promised and we certainly do. Now that we have the citizens, we have published all our uh, uh, demonstrators and the citizens are working. We want to start a critical thinking course and critical scientific critical, and how you treat uncertainty, <coughs> how you treat the, the opinion of experts, how you treat the collectively the collective thinking versus heard thinking. All these things will try with concrete examples, which are the four or five examples that we just presented to you, we try to illustrate and work them out. Then uh, the, we need to increase the means of participation other than web. We discovered colleagues from uh, the Czech Republic that they, they have an app where uh, they can detect your app, your mobile can detect cosmic rays and a cosmic ray shower. And so you put many people together and they participate. And when you have a cosmic shower, which are rare, it's one per century per kilometer square. So you need many apps. Uh, then you can uh, see, uh, and then have them used to, to measure cosmic rays just by having their apps working. Then, as I said, we need to specialize uh, the interactions, that is, PCs. And we have a multi messenger one that we start uh, circulating in June. Uh, in schools, in universities, in visitor centers where people can sit up and with our help uh, or the help of somebody from the local can help them. I think that would be also a helpful uh, thing that should be added in all of the things. I'm, leaving, I'm finishing. 
The other thing we want to do is construct and distribute the sensors for use in schools and elsewhere. We have ideas, for instance, for cosmic rays about that. Then uh, the last, a very ambitious idea, extend the inclusion between the current scientific front to Aztec. Aztec is a world coined by our friend, uh, Thomas Saraceno. It's called Art, Science and Traditional uh, Ecological Knowledge. So this would link astroparticle alerts distributed by the Webster Wave Gravitational Wave Observatories and other laboratories. Environmental and geophysical alerts, earthquakes, clouds, and biological alerts, dolphins, whales, etc. I told you about all this. We take traditional ecological knowledge, people like uh, tri tribes, tribe thinking, and also why not animal uh, sensing, encouraging users to engage with citizen science and build their own planetary sensing practice. And thank you. That's all. Sorry if I took more time. Okay, thank you very much, Stavros. Uh, now I I ask all the panelists to uh, open their cameras, and uh, we can start the the panel discussion that uh, will go on for uh, about twenty minutes. Uh, the panel discussion is of course uh, instrumental uh, to um, uh, gather insights uh, that will be used afterwards to develop the policy roadmap for research infrastructures in uh, in Europe. Uh, okay, so I think that we already have uh, uh, questions, a question from uh, the audience. Um, okay, it was a, a question by Angela Mogin that was uh, uh, answered by, by Marina Manzoni. Maybe Marina, you can uh, inform everybody. Uh, perhaps not everybody has uh, has read about the, the, the question. So the question uh, uh, is, what are your thoughts on promote uh, citizen science uh, so that the idea reaches more people and inspires them to, to contribute? Uh, and according to the experience of the, uh, of the audience, so platforms like Zooniverse uh, can, uh, are mostly uh, discovered by word of mouth, so they are not, uh, uh, they are not yet, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, very, very spread, uh, spread out. So what are the thoughts of the, of the panelists? Maybe we can start with, with Marina. Yes, thank you, Francesco. I can see two main issues here. One is to uh, raise the interest in the audience and second, how to reach them and how to um, involve them. So basically three. Uh, the, the more you have um, to show that there is a, a benefit and interest for them as well in helping your projects uh, uh, coming to the results, of course, the more interest you get attract, attractive. So the higher, the objective, the closer the objectives of the projects are to the audience, the higher the participation will be for sure. So in that way, um, you have to find something in your project that can appeal the audiences and the communities to participate in them. And to keep such engagement, you also need to uh, empower them by making them feel ownership in the design, development, and methodology of the projects, especially uh, start at the early phase. Uh, if you show that there is something for them also, and not just your own objectives, they will get automatically more, more interested and, and more engaged, that, that's for sure. And the other one, how to attract communities, Zooniverse is not enough. <laughs> Um, social media, social medias, networking, and maybe gamification. I, I'm also new to gamification. Eh? It was my colleague Sven Schade who opened up this world to me, and I realized that uh, these gamers are some somehow similar to scientific geeks. They are gamers geeks. So I'm sure these two communities get, can get together and do something very, very, very good. Okay, this is uh, very interesting. So uh, we can see a clear incentive uh, for citizens to be engaged, uh, citizen scientists. And, but on the other hand, what is the incentive for uh, research infrastructures in having uh, citizens working as citizen scientists? 
uh, Stavros, would you like to, yeah, I want to give your thing? First, also give my you know three point answer to okay. the first question, and then uh, and then say the rest. Yeah, I think there are three things we can do. One is the hands-on experience. I mean, I said that that people now after the pandemic they would like to to see people. I mean, we just got, I don't know about CERN, we just got the doubling of our, of the students that want to come and work here during the summer because people want to see other people and go away from the Zoom uh, we are all living. So that's the one first thing that we should do is specialize what I call specialization. I mean, put it, uh, two things, put, put that even the web in places where you can, you can interact with others. Second, if the hands-on experience would mean to make some detectors, and we can make at least, we cannot put a CERN in every, in every corner, but we can put some detectors uh, that are even environmental, etc., etc., to put them together. Uh, yeah. Third, as I said, is the, I, mean, I, I think that we like a lot. It is the inclusion, the increasing the inclusion try to understand the space and time and matter differently than with the eyes, also with the sound, through vibration. This is exciting, even for me, I'm an old man. So these three, I would say, look for me something that is promising. Now, the research infrastructures, I think that I said one thing, and I think we're at the beginning of a story, and at the end, there will be people that will make discoveries, some kinds of discoveries, through their participation in all this. They, they have been in astronomy, the green planets, uh, just said a small thing about us, but maybe other things that people can see that we cannot see or hear that we cannot hear. So try, to, as I, so Marina said it already, actually exactly the same thing. Try to make, to make them, you know, discover themselves things. Yeah, so, so we are going to leverage the wisdom of the crowd, let's say, and we're going to increase the firepower of the scientific community by integrating also citizens. Yes. Let's see. And uh, Emmanuel, uh, um, yes. raised. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, now, I, um, I just follow up with what was said earlier by Marina and, and Stavros. Um, of course, there is the technical involvement of having computing Ava uh, power available, which is idle, and that, that can contribute uh, to um, to supporting the LHC program. Um, but I think if you want to take it to another level, that's where it's it's not only um, rote uh, computing power which is needed, but also try to get uh, the young people, particularly, uh, excited and fascinated by the by the science behind what they're doing. And I think that is, is a very important ingredient in reaching out to the public uh, and, may, and, may, and conveying the fascination of doing fundamental research to the wider society. And I think that will get more involved in, in, in uh, let's say, citizen science. Um, so we do, we do that, um, obviously, we bring in, as I, in one of my slides I showed, we have, before COVID, we had 150,000 visitors on guided tours here at CERN. Um, that's, uh, we, we do receive about a factor of three more applications or requests to visit, but we can't handle all that. Um, and now with our new uh, platform, um, the Science Gateway, a new public engagement center, we hope to be reaching out to many more people or hundreds of thousands of people that we couldn't do so before. Um, and uh, hands-on experiments, which will convey and get people excited in, in this uh, science. Um, and also during the COVID, we took the opportunity to restructure some of our programs. Um, we, because people couldn't come on site, we, we enhanced our virtual visits. Uh, we have developed uh, MOOC courses in particle physics. And obviously all this will remain and uh, will help us reach out to many more people than we could pre-COVID. So in a way, COVID helped us um, to develop the means to, to reach out to a, a, a wider public, which um, we hope that they will also contribute to citizen science projects at CERN. LHC at, at home is a very important element of that. We, we have thousands of participants helping 
real science doing simulations of data in, of, for the LET experiments, ATLAS, CMS, LETB, uh, theory, accelerator science. They're all contributing to that, but it'd be nice to get them also excited about what lies behind just the CPU. This is very interesting. So I see a first uh, point that uh, remains a bit open. It's about attribution. So we know that citizens one day will discover something or we help discovering something. So how do we attribute the, the scientific uh, discovery? And uh, uh, if we set some rules, you know, in, normally in science, uh, in attributions of, uh, you know, authorships of papers, for instance, uh, there is... Um, uh, uh, a lot, uh, uh, th there are a lot of rules that come from, from practice. They are not set in stone. Uh, they are not uh, very uh, really written down. So how are, are we going to uh, uh, attribute the scientific discovery and to have, let's say, a, a mechanism for that? Who wants to say something? I can start. Yes, sir. Maybe. Um, because yes. I, um, I teased uh, with this a bit uh, during my presentation. Um, I've seen that um, common practice appears to be to um, add a section on acknowledgements where the contributions of citizen science um, is listed. Um, I think this, this might come in handy if I would be running a project and I would recognize the contributions of all the citizens that were involved in that project. In cases where I would use um, open access data that other citizens have collected, this is where may mentioning someone more an anonymously might don't do the cut because there's not the connection they have not, they would have not been involved in my project. So there's a bit of an issue there. And also um, GDPR issues must be observed or questions uh, when listing names. Um, I don't remember what project, I guess more than one, um, um, list um, citizen scientists as co-authors, depending on their involvement in the project. Um, but of course, as you said, Francesco, there are um, unwritten rules about um, academic publishing and how this goes so that I think that um, there's um, some way to go there um, to meet at the same level. That might be, let's say, incentives like, uh, I don't know, you discover a star and you can give the name to, to, the, to the star or uh, something more, uh, let's say, more, more, more practical, like, uh, you know, having um, uh, the, the citizens co-authoring the, the paper. We, we see many papers that, especially coming from experimental science, that uh, have many co-authors. So this can also be, this can also be an interesting uh, an interesting issue. Okay. Um, uh, for what concerns uh, um, citizen science in research infrastructures, uh, I see that uh, what is uh, uh, specific is that uh, a huge quantity of data is created. So uh, in this sense, uh, um, how do we ensure that the data that are provided by citizens are uh, uh, data that uh, uh, are of the best quality or any way that are according to, that are produced according to uh, uh, acceptable standards of quality. Do you have an idea on that? I did not understand uh, the question. Uh, for instance, we, I'm sorry, I don't know if someone, for instance, we, we check uh, each one against each other. We will also will check, for instance, and this is a study, uh, we will check, for instance, the people that uh, classify with sonification and the people that will classify with, uh, with a visual, compare, see if errors, but also increase, eventually increase of perceptual capability by using both or one or the other and things like that. So that's one way, but there is a very good control in general of the things that are, you know, the data that come in. 
the data that come from the users and we, we do okay. that we don't uh, just take it up uh, okay uh and manuel yeah yeah i think i just agree with stavros that uh, there has to be some control from the uh the the scientists working on the project like lhc at home um, to check what comes in of course the the software the the apps which run on on the local computer of some um, of some citizen scientist is developed by the the experiment for example atlas or cms so they know exactly what what goes into it but of course um the the citizen scientist does the simulation by modifying and changing the parameters of this of the simulation testing different models and so forth but so the this has to be cross-checked by the 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 scientists in the collaboration and that's what they do they don't just accept as as uh, at face value uh, claudia and in addition to this uh, i think that not not only scientists sometimes uh, check the data there are um, also some elements of gam gamification sometimes where uh, citizen scientists um, are involved in projects in different groups, so to say. So some uh, some citizens analyze the data, this, which is not analyzed once, but many, many times. And then there are other citizen scientists, which maybe are more experienced, and they uh, have another role in that project, and they check the data. And then maybe sometimes there's even one more layer. And um, so this is yeah, this is um, something to have in mind when designing citizen science projects because it's not the same kind of, of design and of um, standard procedures that have to be followed when carrying more academic research. And, and that's what I was mentioning before that um, training is needed because this is not um, self, um, well, it's not common sense. This has to, to be learned and there's a, a reason as to why um, yeah, this, this should happen. I see. Okay, there is also a question from uh, the audience from uh, uh, Silvana Munzi. So she asks if the involvement of children represents an ethical issue or a privacy issue. And uh, as uh, Stavros uh, reacted, so basically there is the authorization uh, from the parents that is, uh, that is asked. So it is uh, it is not a, a real uh, a big issue but i was wondering uh, um what would be uh, the uh, function of the european open science cloud in uh, uh, allowing or stimulating citizen science so the european open science cloud as i understand it will be a cloud where uh, uh, basically um, uh, that will contain analytics uh, analytic services and scientific data so do you think that uh, uh, the European Open Science Cloud uh, can uh, be instrumental in boosting citizen science? If, if yes, why or how? Uh, yeah, I have, uh, you, you know, we went for, uh, sorry for intervening too so much. Uh, <clears throat> we started having one event here now we are one event per week, and uh, soon we will be one event per day, and then go one event per minute. Our computing uh, demands start increasing and reaching exactly the high luminosity LHC level. And even when you want to make a uh, low latency alert, as we call it, say, I've seen something. Did anybody else see the same thing? either in gravitational waves, of course, we have a closed uh, neat uh, network, but also in the observatories. There, you need a lot of computing power. And you give me an idea, I mean, why not? Uh, but, but this is not really citizen science. You just, as ET in the past, you use the, com even, you can even use the computing power available around the world. Of course, the open cloud, first and above, but why not also the computing power available around the world to calculate because it becomes a very 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 uh, difficult thing but this is just it's just an idea that comes you know late uh, in the evening it's not i have to you know to check it whether it's possible or not. okay interesting uh, any other idea marina Yes, 
In response to the question uh, concerning the con contribution for children, I, mean, I know that there are many cities uh, who specifically launch campaign uh, for the participation of children. For example, they uh, call the campaign, how would you see your city in the future? Where would you put your playground? Where would you put your uh, cycling pist? Where would you put your, uh, your school? So they do. Uh, ask children for uh, for this kind of information and this participation, or even in in designing the urban areas. So there must be there are some ways to uh, protect uh, privacy of children and do it in compliance to ethical uh, principles. That that's for sure. And uh, coming to your question concerning Open Science Cloud, uh, I believe that the project is specifically designed to prototype and implement uh, um, services uh, to help to support the quality of data um, by using machine learning, automatic video recognition, advanced mobile and application interfaces, and other cutting edge technologies. So in that respect, it's one of the uh, bonus uh, of the projects. And what is also interesting of this project, that's why both Cloud and myself mentioned it, is that is also the visibility and acknowledgement recognition of the data contributors from different providers um, is given into the project. So this could also be uh, looked at as a good practice or as a reference point to find out how best to uh, cite or acknowledge contributions and how to engage and, and um, attract contributors from different um, let's, levels, uh, from simple citizens to the academic, to the industry, to the public officials in the city council. There are so many um, contributors who could contribute besides the scientists. And again, um, as Claudia was, was saying, there are different ways to um, check the information gathered depending on the level of accuracy, scientific soundness you are looking for. So each project has a, a different pattern, has a different protocol according to the use that this information is, uh, is support to provide. Is this of purely scientific use? Is this uh, for uh, achieving another purpose? So it can be a little bit less, uh, let's say, uh, or comply to different protocols. It really depends uh, on the on the project itself, and that is why it is important that participants are there since the beginning. They need to understand the purpose. What's in it for them? What's the purpose for the project and for them as well? And understand what's behind, and therefore it, this also will be a, a good incentive to participate in trainings which also will be earmarked and adapted to the different purposes of the project. So there's no solution fits all in, in, in few words. Perfect. Uh, so thank you very much. I think that we, uh, we are up to, to no, we, we don't have, uh, uh, we, we are finishing. So any last declaration from anybody? It will be very interesting. Will you put the, the, the slides somewhere, uh, I guess? So yes, yes, we will circulate the slides to everybody um, in the following days. And of course, I'm going to circulate the, the structure of the roadmap uh, in commentable format to show which kind of work uh, we are, uh, we are uh, uh, carrying out. Okay, so thank you everybody. Uh, thanks a lot to our speakers. Uh, we're going to circulate also uh, to the, um, the, the video to the, to, the, uh, to the audience. Thanks a lot to the, to the audience. And uh, we will keep you informed about uh, the next steps of our project and uh, the next events that we're going to carry out. Thanks a lot and have a nice afternoon. Thank you very much, Francisco. Very, very interesting yeah. conversation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.